in the interest of time, I guess we'll go ahead and get started and uh, just take a couple minutes here as people get on to welcome everybody. Thanks for being on today. I know this is a topic that you all probably heard somewhat about, but um, hopefully today we can get you some more information and answer the questions that you have regarding these payments. It's a beautiful day here in Manhattan, Kansas. Hopefully it is for you across the state or the other states that are represented today. I know we've had some terrible winds here lately. So seeing the sunshine and a little less wind is definitely welcome. My name is Robin Reed. I'm an extension farm economist here at the K-State Department of Agricultural Economics. I'm joined today by Todd Barrows. He is the walking encyclopedia of anything farm program related. So he's gonna help me out here a little later in the presentation and we're gonna just kind of tag team on this information today. He's an agricultural program specialist with the Kansas Farm Service Agency. We also have on today, Chuck Pettijohn, who is our acting state executive director with the Kansas Farm Service Agency. And he's gonna speak a little bit later just on the status of the offices across our state and how you can talk to um, one of the program technicians in your own county. So with that, I think we'll get started. If you could keep your microphones muted and cameras off, if you have questions, we very much welcome you to type them in the chat as we go along, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. We do have a fairly short presentation today compared to what we did for CFAP 1 and 2. There's not a ton of new stuff at this point, so we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today, what we are going to be talking about today is the newly announced USDA Pandemic Assistance for Producers program. And I'm going to be very careful not to call this CFAP 3. What this actually is are changes to and additional payments to CFAP 1 and 2. So there's not really an official acronym for this at this time, but we'll be talking about the Pandemic Assistance for Producers program announced last week. Put my slides to advance here. So just to give you a little review of these programs since they started during the pandemic last year. So CFAP, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program was announced for the first time last summer, end of May. CFAP 1 uh, made $10 billion in payments to agricultural producers. 459 million of that came here to Kansas. CFAP 2 was announced last fall. So September through December of 2020 is when you could register for that program. That paid out to date $13.2 billion with 654 million of that coming here to Kansas. Now there was something that came out earlier in January and that was the CFAP additional assistance rule. And that is where they announced an additional $17 uh, top up payment for swine eligibility for contract growers to enroll in CFAP 2. This was put on hold when the administration changed. So while this was announced at a roughly 2.3 billion, that actually did not go forward because of the administrative change. Now, what was announced last week again is the Pandemic Assistance for Producers Program. And this is more of a big umbrella relief package, which CFAP is now underneath or a small component of. So part of these payments were authorized in the last administration by the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, which was passed last December. So we already kind of knew $20 an acre might be coming, but this is the official rollout of that um, act that was passed back in December. Now, what is this package in its entirety? Um, I noted here $12 billion for this package is the price tag that it's estimated as. The first two bullet points here are kind of what's rolling out now. So CFAP 2, as it was originally done last fall, is reopening for 60 days starting April 5th. And this was to reach more small and socially disadvantaged producers specialty crops and organic producers that just weren't aware last time around, last fall, that they could sign up for this program and it would benefit their operation. The thing that you're probably mostly interested in today is the additional top up 
payments. And top up just means these are additional payments on top of CFAP one and two that have already happened. So you'll see for these, there's actually no additional sign up. They are just going to be deposited in your bank account based on your already approved application. So that's estimated at 1.1 billion for cattle producers across the US and 4.5 billion for row crops. And as you can see with a price tag on this relief package of 12 billion, this is a, a smaller component of that overall price tag. What else is gonna be in this package? So my third bullet point here, these are new assistance programs that it'll take a while for them to develop the rules and implement. So we're gonna be watching these and put out info, more information as we know more but basically what they're looking at is payments to renewable fuel processors, timber harvesters, um, support for the, the food chain in general to help stabilize what was disrupted by the pandemic. So some things they have listed here that we don't know specifics of yet would be euth euthanized livestock and poultry, some payments there for producers who had to do that because of the um, processing plant issues last year possible other corrections to the two CFAP programs that are not part of what we're talking about today. And specifically, they mentioned dairy in there. So right now we don't know additional payments on dairy, but there could be some coming. And then developing infrastructure to support donation of perishable commodities through food donation programs and our schools. And I have a link there for other things that they are specifically listing as part of this package but I just grabbed the ones that I thought would be most relevant to those that are on today. Now let's dive into row crops. So we, we know the payment amount, but how does that actually get applied? So just to recap, because this is important for where this top up payment applies, CFAP one, when it was announced last May, was paying based on unpriced inventory of row crops in storage on January 15th. So that one's done and gone. We're not really worried about that one when we're looking at these top up payments. What it does apply to is CFAP 2. So in CFAP 2, you had planted acres in 2020, which also included your wheat that was planted in 2019, harvested in 2020. So the regular reporting process, you reported your planted acres on your FSA 578. And that was used to make that CFAP2 payment. Commodities were lumped into two different categories for CFAP2. The first being price trigger. So any of our commodities that experienced a 5% loss between January and July used a formula payment rate. And that was how much of the crop would be marketed between then and the end of the year times the crop payment rate times the producer's APH. So a lot of you for your corn, soybeans, wheat, sorghum, had that formula payment rate. And then we had crops in the flat rate category that just got a straight $15 per acre. And I've listed the crops here, but just know again, you really can't make changes. What you reported on CFAP, or what you reported FSA for your 2020 planted acres, what was on uh, your FSA form and what approved application was for CFAP2 is what you'll get this top up payment on. So just wanted to remind you what crops were eligible for that. Now, as you heard, $20 an acre is what you're gonna get paid. Um, as I said, it's based on CFAP2. The important thing here, you don't need to apply for this. A top up payment is just paid on top of an already approved CFAP2 application. You're gonna receive these quite quickly. So by April 10th, you'll start seeing these hitting your bank accounts. And a question that we have received quite a bit is, who gets the payment if there's a new operator in 2021? It's actually the person on the CFAP2 application. So it is a payment for last year's crop. So that new operator does not get the payment on the ground. It is the operator from 2020 that receives that payment. Now going on to livestock. So an interesting thing here, while row crops have the top up payment on CFAP two, livestock have a top up payment on CFAP one. 
So just to kind of go through what those two CFAP programs were for livestock. CFAP one had a payment rate on cattle that were sold between January 15th and April 15th based on the class of cattle. So fed cattle got a lot bigger payment than um, feeder cattle and so, and so on. Now, anything that was an inventory between April 16th and May 14th got a $33 per head payment. And that was your highest owned inventory that you claimed on CFAP1. And we got to include breeding stock in this um, inventory. Contrary to that, CFAP2 had your highest owned inventory between April 16th and August 31st that you could claim and get that $55 per head on. But this time they did not include breeding stock. So what I want you to focus in on here is this part. This is where the top up payment will be coming in on the $33 per head animals that you claimed on CFAP1, which again included breeding stock. Now this is important as we're gonna talk about at the end to payment limitations as well, because um, your payment limitation would be based on your CFAP1 application in this case. Now your new payments to cattle, you might have seen these already. We're going to be getting an additional $7 on our feeder cattle less than 600 pounds or so our calves. Feeder cattle over 600 pounds, $25.50. Fed cattle, $63. Uh, mature slaughter cattle or cold cattle, $14.75. And then all other cattle, $17.25. So all other cattle uh, would be our breeding animals. Now, just to kind of put this all together, again, we're looking back at CFAP1. So we had these payment rates here for the cattle that were sold between January 15th and April 15th, $33 for anything in inventory after that, up to May 14th, picked the highest day, and now these additional payments. And why they announced these additional payments, we had a lot of producers that were caught, especially in the fed cattle class, where they were holding fat cattle and could not get them through a slaughter facility by April 15th. So instead of those cattle getting a $214 payment, they got a $33 payment. And obviously that is a huge difference for those producers that are holding those fat cattle, have that additional feed expense, and also a price decline. So these top up payments were to help kind of uh, buffer those losses and the difference in the loss levels between the cattle classes. Um, Todd, I'm gonna bring you on here for a second. We did have some producers on their CFAB1 application not break their inventory out by class for that $33. And Todd's gonna talk about how you get that corrected in your CFAP1 application. Yeah, thanks a lot, Robin. Um, we do know, just so everybody is listening out there, we do know, as Robin stated, that there were producers across the state um, that did not report their inventory cattle correctly under CFAP1. In other words, and those were the cattle on inventory between April the 16th and May 14th. And it varies whether or not they were instructed to do so by county offices or if uh, they just did it on their own. But what we're hearing is they grouped them all together into one category for simplicity because obviously under CFAP1, that was all one payment rate at $33 per head. Well, now it makes a difference. As we speak today, there is no modifications to that CFAP1 application to switch those. However, we were told yesterday that, DC, that our national office uh, is taking a look at that and they are going to be uh, sending out some additional guidance on how we will handle those applications when, that in, when the inventory may not have been broke out by category as need be. So I would just encourage producers to be patient. Uh, there should be some additional guidance coming out on how, on how to handle those situations. And as soon as we know something, we will be publicizing that and putting that out to not only to our field offices, but also through our other means of publication. All right, thank you for that clarification, Todd. So if you're in that category, don't panic yet. That is being worked out. 
All right. So again, just to emphasize, these are the cattle we're talking about um, in that inventory on April 16th to May 14th that were claimed. Now I'm not gonna go through this because um, other than that, that um, situation that Todd described, you really can't claim your cattle in different categories at this point. But just for your own knowledge, these are how USDA has defined what animals fall into what category. So you have these slides and you can look through that in more detail on your own. Now, these new payments to you, cattle, um, you don't need to apply. Again, this is a top-up payment on CFAP1. I'm going to have Todd talk about this bullet point here in just a second. These are automatically paid. You should start seeing them as well on April 10th. And we're going to talk about this more in detail at the end, but just to um, start to get you thinking about it, your payment limitation for cattle is dependent on your total CFAP1 application. Whereas row crops, again, we're looking at adding that top up payment to CFAP2. So your payment limitation would be based on CFAP2. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you, Todd, to finish out the presentation. All right, thanks a lot, Robin. And yeah, as Robin stated, um, did want to explain just uh, that modification there or that one exception there uh, for those producers that will be asking for, or that will be receiving the top up payment uh, for their cattle and their CFAP1 application. If you are an entity uh, for cattle or swine, then you have, you will have the opportunity starting April the 5th to modify your CFAP one application um, to request and seek additional payment limitation up to 500 or 750,000, depending on the members doing active personal labor, active personal management. And the reason why this is just opened up for cattle and swine is because this additional payment limitation option was not available during CFAP1 enrollment. And so we're now gonna give those producers, this is the only time at present that you can modify a CFAP1 application is if you are an entity um, that has cattle production uh, or cattle uh, CFAP1 application or a swine CFAP1 application. So, and we're gonna talk more about that payment limitation and how that increase works on a later slide. But I did wanna mention that that would be the, that currently that is the one time that you can modify a CFAP1 application. And Todd, before we move on, there's a couple questions specific to this. So I'm gonna ask you now, or make sure we talk about this now. Um, if a rancher did not file a CFAP1, but did do a CFAP2, he missed the deadline for CFAP1, is there anything he can do for this round of top up payments? Yeah, good question, Robin. And unfortunately, uh, we've got that one before, but unfortunately CFAP1 is not being reopened. And so unfortunately, if you did not timely submit the CFAP1 application previously, you would not be eligible for the top up payment. Thank you for that clarification, Todd. And another one here, I just wanna make sure to ask you, how do you know if your CFAP1 was completed accurately? If you didn't remember how you lumped your cattle into those classes for the $33 payment, how do you know if you need to adjust that if you're allowed to? Um, you're going to have to, if you don't have a copy of that CFAP1 original application that you submitted, or if you, the other thing you could do is you could, if you have a copy of your estimated payment calculator report that would have been provided at the time of CFAP1 application, that would also indicate um, how you uh, categorized that, those inventory uh, cattle. But the bottom line is uh, you're going to have to work with your local service center office and um, ask them to re and they would have a copy of your application on file in which that's how you're going to have to find out. So basically you're going to have to self check if you read yep. it correctly. Okay. That's correct. All right. Thank you, Todd. We will go on here. 
All right. As Robin mentioned earlier, uh, just shortly, a, a little bit on the hogs and the pigs, which we haven't really talked much about yet, uh, is that the, those uh, top up payments were put on hold. And that is correct. Um, there was uh, originally there was talk about uh, the hog industry. They did receive a $17 per head inventory payment under CFAP 1. And uh, there was talk that they would get an additional $17 a head as a top up payment at the end of the 2020 calendar year. When we did change administrations, uh, the current administration did put that on hold. Uh, and doesn't mean that that, I want to stress that that doesn't mean that that's a dead deal. Um, what we have been talking about or been told is uh, just what's there in red, and that is. Our USDA national office leadership is working with the swine leaders, uh, swine industry leaders to make sure that um, all of the needs and are being captured for a broader elevation to make sure that the necessary regulations and the necessary and to make sure if there doesn't need to be any modifications to current law language so we make sure we meet the need of our our swine industry so they're just taking a little bit of extra time here uh, to go ahead and review those regulations to review those existing rules to and and review the needs to make sure that you know when we sat down and look at it on a broader playing field as this uh, pandemic relief act was supposed to do to make sure that the needs of the swine industry are being captured before we go ahead with an additional top up payment so swine producers um, be patient and i will also mention that uh, under cfap 2 there was a provision that came in late and and uh, in the fall uh, not too long before uh, sign up deadline ended that allow for the additional uh, of contract growers to be eligible under CFAP 2. And if you uh, weren't, if you fail to, if you are a contract grower for the swine industry, and again, this is strictly swine, but if you are a contract grower for the swine industry, you missed the December 11th deadline, you can now enroll under CFAP 2 starting April 5th and by providing a copy of your revenue uh, contract for that loss of revenue. And we'll talk about that again on another slide. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to move on. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, CFAP 2 and we're gonna talk a little bit about specialty crops and, um, and we get into sales commodities. And while, you know, sales commodity, our sales commodity producers aren't as large in number as our row crop and cattle producers in the state, this still is an important part of the program to those producers that do raise our fruit and vegetable crops, uh, uh, tree nuts, um, and other specialty livestock that are used for uh, food and fur, fiber and feathers um, across our state. So this is important for them. And I will note there, you'll see two, uh, two categories or two products that are uh, highlighted in red. And, and we highlighted those just to bring them out because again, they were late ads like the commodity growers for swine. Uh, they were right at the tail end uh, when, when they publicized the rules and added turf grass sod and also pullets as a sales commodity uh, eligibility under this verbiage in CFAP 2. Now I do want to make it known that uh, very important here, um, two things. Number one is if you want a more detailed crop Pacific list, as Robin's indicated there on the slide, there's a link to farmers.gov. Uh, CFAP specialty crops where you can go there and get a complete list of all uh, sales commodity or specialty crops across the country uh, that would be applicable. And then the other thing I want to make everybody aware of is when we're talking about specialty livestock 
uh, here, we are excluding under CFAP2 all equine, all breeding stock, any type of companion, companion or comfort animal, any pets, anything used for recreational purposes or hunting or game purposes, those are not allowed under the sales commodity. It truly is uh, livestock that are, are raised for the production of food for fiber. So we left this chart in here uh, just to uh, remind you all uh, and, or for those uh, specialty crop producers our sales commodity producers that may not have uh, caught the, the initial sign up period, uh, just to let them know how your, um, your uh, payment will be calculated under the CFAP2 uh, specialty crop sales commodity provisions. And how, you, the, how this chart works is, uh, again, you will, as a producer, you will be uh, certifying to your 2019 sales as you reported on your income tax return. Now, um, that first line and how you work this, if you go down to the left, that's your different sales ranges. So if you sold between zero and $49,999, then your CFAP2 payment is going to be 10.6% of that, whatever that dollar amount is in that range. Now, if you, if you, had greater sales than uh, $49,999, then you go up to the next range for the additional amount of sales. So the first $50,000 of sales is 10.6%. The second $50,000 to $99,999 is a additional payment of 9.9%. Then if you still have higher sales between 100,000 and 500,000, you're at 9.7% and so on. Until you get down to the very bottom, sales over a million dollars are gonna be at 8.8%. So it's accumulative, it's an added, it's, it's an added. So uh, compilation of your total sales. So uh, everybody, the first 50,000 is 10.6%. Then the next 50,000, 9.9 and so on. And, and we provide an example of how that works. Now with uh, specialty crops, uh, and livestock do want to mention that um, like all of our CFAP programs, CFAP2, this is, this is a self-certification. Um, and as I mentioned, for those specialty crops and livestock or sales commodity producers, you are going to be um, certifying um, from your uh, income tax returns for 2019. Now, the only change from the previous signup period for sales commodities is that first bullet. And I wanna bring that out and highlight that. If you had income on your 2019 specialty crop or livestock crop that comes, that fits the category for sales commodities, and you received a uh, crop insurance indemnity on that 2019 crop, either through a private insurance company, through NAP, or through a WIP plus payment, you can add that on to at your income that you reported on your 1099 and call that sales income. So those insurance indemnities for crop losses plus WIP plus payments, if you happen to receive those, you can include that as sales income on and above what you had reported on your income tax return for 2019. Uh, now, the question comes up then is, you know, what happens for the new producer that just started growing these crops or producing these livestock in 2020? They didn't have income from 2019. Well, in those cases, you look at the uh, income as reported for the 2020 um, uh, tax year 
on their on their income tax returns. Um, but if they did have sales in 2019, then then 19 is the year of reporting and not 2020. Only new producers for 2020 get to get to bring in sales uh, sales uh, income for the 2020 program year or tax year. Finally, on that slide there, that last bullet, um, uh, just to let you know, eligible cells only include the sale of raw commodities grown by the producer. Any type of value that was added to that product due to processing uh, or packaging uh, for resale um, is not eligible. It's, it's the raw commodity grown by the producer is only type of income that can be claimed. Um, I think we're ready for payment limitation. So as Robin mentioned earlier, um, CFAP1 had its payment limitation of 250,000 and, and, and cattle are gonna be uh, the top up payment for the cattle are going to be uh, looked at that 250,000. While as CFAP2 also had its uh, separate payment limitation of 250,000. And that's what the, the rest of um, uh, are the $20 per acre row crop and all the and the sales commodity payments that all falls under that CFAP2 payment limitation or that $250,000. Um, now, we have talked about, um, and there is for those entities, and I want to uh, take a few minutes and try to explain this, but for those entities, uh, either in, uh, you know, we're talking cattle or swine for CFAP1 or all entities under CFAP2, um, if, if you have two or three members that are providing 400 plus hours of active personal labor, active personal management, you can qualify for additional payment limitation up to 500,000 or $750,000. So how that works is, of course, all entities like an individual will, will receive $250,000 payment limitation. So if you are a sole proprietor LLC with only one member, obviously you're limited at that $250,000 payment limitation. However, if you are a corporation that has multiple members or a limited partnership or some type of, of general partnership, trust or estate where you may have uh, two or three members, if, the, if those members uh, are contributing 400 plus hours of active personal labor, active personal management, then you can qualify with two members, you qualify for 500,000. With three members, you qualify for 750,000. The key point is though, they have to be, you have to be able to document that, they're, that those additional members are doing 400 hours of active personal labor or active personal management. To modify that application is you will, there is a place on the application forms in which you will write down or you will certify which members of that entity are the members that are contributing that, those additional hours of, of labor management. Uh, and so if you are modifying your application for CFAP1, you're going to have to work with your county offices um, to pull back up that approved application and so that you can modify that. Same way with CFAP2. If you're modifying that CFAP2 application, you're gonna to have to work with your local service center office, local county office, so they can uh, provide you that, that uh, original application and so that you can modify it and, and certify if you're seeking that additional payment limitation or if you fit in that category. Todd, I'm going to just, oh, sorry. We no, had go a couple, ahead. couple questions here I think we should address while we're on this topic. Um, the first one being clarification on CFAP1. Was CFAP1 not already made to these entities with a total of three payment limits? If 
labor rules are met. So what, what has changed that they need to modify their CPAP one for livestock application? Um, if they've already modified their application and already getting paid at 750,000, there's nothing more that they can do. It's a done deal. That's, that's the max anyone can have. Yeah, that... I was, uh, yeah, I was thinking CFAP 2 added the language of trust or estate that wasn't in place for CFAP 1, and that might be... That, that, yes, that would be correct. Okay. The other question, does the $250,000 limit include the first payment and the top-up payment together? And that would be yes, mm -hmm. um, but it... Each CFAP has a separate payment limit. So CFAP one has 250, CFAP two has 250, and those top up payments, crops going to CFAP two and livestock going to CFAP one are subject to that same $250,000 payment limit. Yes, that is correct. Okay, just want to make sure we hit those there, so. Yep. Nothing else, we can move on. Let's move on. Okay, so finally let's get down and let's talk about applying for CFAP2. And um, there's multiple ways that you can apply. Um, you can either apply online uh, through farmers.gov and it gives you the link there, uh, dash CFAP. Um, it does take a level two e authorization um, for those producers that have level two e auth, uh, they can go online to that farmers.gov CFAP and apply online. If you want level two e authorization, you'll have to work with your field office and they can walk you through that process to get signed up for level two authorization to do, to do uh, applications online. The other thing that you can do is a producer can go on to farmers.gov CFAP without level two authorization and get the applicable forms and download them and then submit those forms uh, manually through uh, to your local uh, service center office. Um, whether you would do that through fax, whether you do it, scan them in and email them, or most offices have a Dropbox that you can drop those off at. And, and I'm gonna have um, our uh, state executive director Acting State Executive Director uh, Chuck Pettijohn talk about that more in just a minute. The other thing I will say there is on that very last box, um, you know, our service centers are are there to assist. Um, and although due to the the pandemic and, and the situations out there across the country, unfortunately, you know, they the the communication. Uh, isn't allowable face to face at this time. Uh, you're going to have to use, but they are there. They are there to assist. They can be reached by phone, email, or fax. And then the other thing I will want, I do want to point out is again, to mention it briefly, but I'll say it again. If you're wanting to revise an existing application that was already approved under CFAP 1 or CFAP 2, you'll also need to contact your county offices in those cases and work with them because they'll have to provide you that original application. And so you can make that modification where need be. So with that, I'm gonna stop at this time. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I did miss one point, uh, Robin. I do need to talk about one other thing and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Chuck. And that is, um, it's a very important point is, we had producers that missed the deadline um, for CFAP2, that December 11th deadline. And uh, therefore they, they uh, were considered late filed. Those applications will be able to be uh, 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 enrolled as timely submitted at this time. And even the applications that were in the middle of um, some appeal processes or relief processes, those all those applications that were late filed, uh, regardless of what stage of appeal they might have been in for relief to, to try to get back into the program, they will be remanded back to the 
to the service center office of origin and they will be contacting those producers uh, the producers will not have to sign or, or sign in a new form we can accept the application that was submitted late and we can and we'll go ahead and be uh, considering that as timely filed so those producers that missed the December 11th deadline but filed an application anyway and try to go through the appeal process to get relief we will uh, take action on those as timely submitted now at this point in time so with that i think i uh, this would be a good time to stop and let chuck uh, bring him on and let him just talk a little bit about um, our uh, business centers our service offices across the state and uh, how, working with them and the state of uh, uh, the status of our offices. So, Chuck, do you want to you want to take off from there? Yeah, Todd. There, you might answer. There's a couple questions there in the chat before I bore them with my uh, stuff. And so, um, the one question: uh, Does contract grower payments include chicken growers? Uh, Contract grower payments will include chicken growers, uh, but again, that is down the road. That is something that's still being worked out at this point in time. Um, we don't have any specific specifics on that, but we do look for something uh, down the road. And if you want to hit the couple other ones here, Todd, uh, then we can just kind yeah. of go on here. One of them I didn't ask you is how do you find out if you applied for programs one and two? I assume then just contact your local service center as well. You either have to contact your local service center or I guess the other way and it would be to look back at your uh, your bank account um, to see if you would have had a, a CFAP2 payment uh, uh, received. And that would also tell you if you would have applied. But uh, yeah, you'll have to work with your local service center. And just a clarification here, um, the local FSA office said we would not have to apply for this second round of CFAP2 as long as you applied the first time for CFAP2. And that is correct. You know, what we've been talking about here um, in the specialty grower uh, livestock section is if you didn't do CFAP2 the first time around, those top up payments that we talked about in row crops and livestock. Um, just go into your bank account. You don't need to modify those CFAP applications unless um, those special situations we talked about where you didn't break your livestock or your cattle out to, into different classes or um, something with the payment limitations and the entity structure wasn't documented kind of thing. Well, and Robin, and also as if, unless a, uh, I was thinking on the CFAP too specifically, if, they are a sales commodity grower and they had income from crop insurance, NAP or WIP plus that they hadn't included. They could include that now as sales income, which could increase their payment. Sure, yep. Thanks Todd, I forgot about that. Yep. Um, how about one last one and we'll get to Chuck here quick. Uh, producer is just starting in 2020 as a specialty crop grower and sees she is now eligible or he or she is now eligible. Do you prefer they apply online or just with their local extension office or is that just producer preference? Um, so if you are a new uh, specialty crop producer for 2020, um, you can, it's up to you whether you wanna apply online or uh, contact your service center. But my advice would be um, you should contact and work with your local office to make sure that they're not also uh, getting your eligibility forms uh, all that will be needed as well. You can do the CFAP2 application online, but there are some additional eligibility forms that you will have to complete if you have not done so already. Um, mainly a farm operating plan, and then also a CCC 941, which is a consent to disclose your, your um, adjusted gross income. And then last of all, um, there is an AD 1026 form uh, dealing with conservation compliance to make sure that you haven't uh, broke out any uh, highly rotable land 
uh, or converted any wetland. So, so those forms would need to be, you'll need to work with your local service center anyway. So that might be the best place to start if you are a new producer. All right, thanks Todd. Uh, real quickly here, are these payments subject to tax? Yes, this is taxable income for your operation. Is the row crop payment capped at $20 or a formula? Yes, it is a straight $20 on your um, acreage in 2020. Chuck, they keep rolling in, so why don't we get you in here and then we'll keep answering questions. Okay, you bet I can uh, do that. Uh, Kind of what I wanted to talk about, I guess, is the access uh, to our facilities in light of the COVID uh, situation. And Todd already uh, had talked about that. Um, and I, first of all, I just, you know, I want to thank everybody with uh, their patience. Uh, everybody's been super understanding um, during this time and producers have uh, adjusted well, um, as well as our county offices. And it seems like we've kind of changed gears on you um, a little bit. And part of that is due to um, the administration uh, change where that we had um, offices that were, um, we had a reopen plan and uh, we do have a national pandemic coordinator that um, oversees the guidance of uh, our reopening with the uh, coronavirus. And, when the administration came in, um, essentially they they took over and uh, made a few changes. Uh, first and foremost, uh, safety of the employees was their uh, number one concern. And uh, so we did have offices that were allowing customers uh, to come in by appointment and then uh, we shut that off. Uh, first and foremost, I think, you know, like Todd said, we're open for business. Uh, it's just that we are not uh, able to allow customers to come in the facility. And um, they had us go back to a 25% staffing level regards to um, our employees being within the facilities. And even within the facility, we had to um, abide by certain uh, um, of rules, uh, masking, social distancing, uh, private offices, things like that. Um, after quite a bit of pressure, they did allow field offices to go to 50% uh, staff within the facility. So the rest of our employees telework. Um, we are uh, set up that uh, to give them uh, the equipment so they can telework from home. Uh, you call the county office, uh, your phone, uh, we, we'll get to it. The phone should push through to somebody's laptop. They can answer those calls from home. It may push the email, uh, to a voicemail if everybody's uh, tied up on a call, but uh, we, we will do our business that way. Um, so email, fax. Uh, we also are doing a box and one span for electronic signatures and that uh, seems to work well uh, for producers that want to utilize um, that uh, capability. Um, I know that uh, some of the offices have been very uh, creative in um, working with customers uh, outside uh, through a service window, things like that. Um, we have drop boxes, et cetera. So my suggestion would be you know, to talk to your county office, um, see how they're doing business. Those of you have been um, dealing with them on an ongoing ba basis already um, kind of have a, kind of a routine down with them. Moving forward, um, I was just on a call at the national office at, uh, just right before this call. Uh, we're getting closer to uh, some kind of a reopen plan that we can allow customers in the building on a limited basis. We do not know uh, when and um, to what degree. I'm sure that it will be by appointment to start with. Um, we will be requiring a face covering uh, when you come to the facility. And, um, but 
beyond that at this point, um, I do I, I do not know. Um, we have had an uptick in cases. We we track the COVID cases uh, nationally. They do for us, and I know within Kansas, uh, we went quite a while without any employees having um, um, cases and in. in in the last couple of weeks, our case count has uh, went up in the service centers. And uh, so we, we want to be very, very cautious about that. We'll do our very best to provide service to you and to, to work with you um, to get the services. But right now, uh, we are driven by the national office as to our offices being open to the public and how many employees we can have physically in the facilities. And um, I know I've got employees that would love nothing more than to get back into the office and get back into a normal routine. Uh, but at this time, um, we're not able to do that. And uh, we hope here in the next uh, two to three weeks, we'll start to see some changes to that. Um, I'd field any questions, and I do appreciate um, Todd. Uh, he's our resident expert on many, many things, and he does an excellent job um, giving guidance to our state uh, with these programs, and so I appreciate his expertise as well. Chuck, you did have a question here in the chat. Just curious with some of the counties, including schools, that are completely doing away with masking this week why the delay in following the county and state health departments? You know, I wish I had a good answer for that, uh, but, but I don't. Uh, national office uh, is um, dictating our policy and how we react and respond. And so the Biden administration is um, from the secretary, actually, actually out of the White House, uh, our national pandemic commander works directly with the White House and uh, we were at 25% and we were the only agency giving uh, any kind of a relief to go 50% staffing and that's the best relief they would give us and still did not drop the mask mandates, nor did they drop uh, us being able to allow customers come into the building. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I think we got everybody's questions, but if you have more, type them in the chat. Um, Todd answered the one on the dry edible beans. Just to confirm, Todd, that is not an eligible crop. That is correct. It did not meet the price trigger and is not an eligible, considered an eligible flat rate crop. Okay. And I answered those quite quickly. This is a taxable income on your farm that you will be having to claim next year on your taxes. And I forgot the other question. Uh, yeah, that $20 per acre is not a formula that is based on your 2020 planted acres. Right. And, and Rob and I can throw out there. Um, I know there is, uh, didn't, didn't affect many producers, but it did affect a few. Uh, and that is uh, when FSA did their uh, 2020 compliance spot checks uh, based on reported acres on the 578, that did affect uh, uh, some of those uh, eligible planted acres because the way our system works, a spot check is considered a determined acre where a producer certification is a reported acre. And so determined acres uh, take precedence over reported acres. And when those spot checks happened, uh, some of them were before the December 11th deadline, some of them were after that December 11th deadline. And so it just kind of whenever the county office uh, was working through that process. And um, so you may see a small adjustment on, on your payment acres with this second round of top up on that $20 per acre. Because if you were one of those producers that was selected for a national spot check 
And, and now this second round of top up payments will be worked from your determined acres and not your reported acres. So I, I would throw that out as a clarification. All right, thank you, Todd. Uh, just a question here, is there a place for all of the information on these CFAP payments? And I would just direct you to the farmers.gov slash CFAP website. And you can find information, all the different things we talked about today and, and the ones that we didn't for those out there that have different uh, specialty crops and things that we didn't specifically talk about. Um. Uh, Robin, if I could jump in, there is a new question that just popped up on the chat from a specialty crop producer, and it is a very good question. And the question deals with, if you're a new specialty crop producer for the 2020 uh, crop year, can you now claim your sales for the full year, or does that still cut off at the December 11th deadline that was original for the CFAP2 application? Great question. And it is, you could modify, that would be another reason to modify your, um, your CFAP2 application for specialty crop growers, because it would now be for the uh, entire uh, 2020 uh, tax year, whatever that may be for your, your specific case. So yes, uh, you, if you had uh, sales uh, between December 11th and December 31st, and you include those sales on your 2020 uh, income tax, then yes, you could, you would want to, that would be a reason you would want to modify your CFAP2 application and, re, and you can report those additional sales. Great question. All right, we're approaching the two o'clock hour here. If you have any remaining questions, I encourage you to type those in the chat ASAP because we're going to be wrapping this up. Um, but if you think of anything afterwards, don't hesitate to contact me as well, and I will try to get your questions answered. Chuck or Todd, anything else for the good of the cause before we sign off today? Um, Robin, the only thing I would say is just I wanted to uh, just put a plug out there. Um, thank you for your efforts and Rich for uh, all the work that you guys put in and pulling this together uh, for producers, not only in our state, but across the country who, ever, who happens to be online today. Um, we are thankful and happy to assist and partner with you on this project. And again, we, we thank you for, for your efforts and your work and your leadership on this. It's much appreciated. Well, thank you, Todd. I definitely appreciate the partnership we made through this whole pandemic on getting this information out. So thank you for your expertise in this matter and helping me along the way. So with that, we'll sign off. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day. This recording will be made available and Rich Llewellyn will be sending that out to you. So thank you again for participating with us today.